It's a, it's a great part of the week because it is time for our Future Politics panel. Joining us this morning are Jonathan Gibson, political commentator, and for the very first time, Charlie Downs, who is also a political commentator. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. David. Very good to see you. Always nice to have new people. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Jonathan's an old hand. <laughs> He's Sorry, been doing yeah. it. Yeah. Um, so so let, let, let's ease in gently, if I may. I said last week, I think it's so fantastic when you have young people who are energised and excited by politics. So, just as a quick uh, intro, why did you get involved? Why do you care? Why do I care about politics? Well, as a young person, politics to me seems everywhere, you know? It's part of my family's history, you know? I've, I've long heard about the things that my family went through as a result of political situations. You know, I come from, from a Jewish background, so obviously politics has massively shaped mine and my family's experiences. So through then, I became very passionate about it, also in terms of an international stage, in terms of world politics, in terms of international issues, and the real impact it has on people's lives, you know? The way in which it interacts in society and the way that I feel everyone should have a voice and should be represented presented and having being able to say and share their experience in politics i think it's just absolutely so important that people get involved to make sure that we have scrutiny and that we have involvement to make sure our country has a bright future and what about you charlie um i got involved in politics because basically i'm dissatisfied by the state of things as they are in this country and sort of in in the wider world as well um it's been it sort of started as a personal journey um it, it, it's sort of you know a change in my attitude as i've grown and matured um, and that has then sort of trickled down and mapped itself onto politics. And I look at the world, I look at, you know, this country, and as I say, I'm dissatisfied. You know, I, I've, you know, I have a, a keen interest in history, um, and, you know, this is history stretching back to Alfred the Great, Ethelstan. You wow. Know, proper, you know, old English history. And, you know, I, 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 I'm so in touch with the, the, the nature of this country, what it is. It's a storied and textured mm. and special place. And I don't see that represented. So, you, so that's so interesting. So you feel that actually the politicians of today, mm. A, may not be learning from history, mm. and B, certainly not making this great country as good as it can be. Absolutely. The time preference is so, uh, so unbelievably short. Um, there's no eye to, you know, the, point. The, 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 you know, the far future. Because, you know, again, you look at our history, and this, as I said, is a storied you know, incredible place. Mm. You know, nowhere else like this exists on Earth. You mm. know, it is... It's beautiful. Yeah, this, I mean, gra this grand aesthetic project that is Britain. I mean, it's extraordinary, isn't it? The rich tapestry. You only have to walk around London or many cities, mm. many of our industrial cities, just to see the rich tapestry of history. Absolutely. So, 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 Jonathan, just in terms of that, are you you two a bit weird? I mean, because <laughs> well, well, I'm being in, in the nicest possible sense. Just you know, young people normally just shrug and go. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, <laughs> I'm, I think, I'm being disingenuous. No, yeah. I, I think if you look at the vo voting turnouts among young people, it's shockingly low. If you look at the interest in politics, again, it's very low. I don't think it's typical necessarily to have young people engaged and involved in politics. And I think a lot of people, I would, I would agree with you completely in saying the lack of representation in politics is changed enormously. If you look at the politicians that make up of our political bodies, you know, 99% are bachelor's degrees, you know, they all come from very middle class backgrounds on the whole. If you look in America, it's the same. What average senator earns 1.32 million a year, half the House of Representatives are millionaires. You know, the politicians and the political body don't represent people. And I think as students and as young people, Again, that's also reflected. Well, I think it's brilliant. I think it's absolutely brilliant. And and your point, actually, Charlie, I think is a really resemblant one, which is actually we never think about the long term. There is no long term planning in this country. You know, everything is for that electoral cycle, isn't it? It's just five years. And that just seems nutty to me. Yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, it's all about just getting re-elected. Getting re-elected. You know, that's the top priority, which you can understand. I mean, the incent that is what this system incentivizes. Yeah, I know. And, and it's, it's all wrong. But let's let's now go to policy. So just in terms of the top three priorities, let's imagine for the moment that you two are now in government. Uh, what would your top three priorities be and why, Jonathan? So it's really hard for me to come up with three because I just have one, honestly, right now that I think everyone needs to be focusing and working towards on. And, and that, that is? is the economy and the cost of living crisis, you know? I think it's such an important and personal issue right now that I think it's something we all need to be focusing on. This winter is going to be incredibly different, difficult for people. And I think we can't let the ball drop in terms of this 
issue. We can't let the ball drop in terms of making sure that people are able to afford and we need to make sure discourse happens in terms of how we focus our resources and focus our intention to make sure people don't starve, to make sure people are able to get through the winter, are able to heat their homes, are able to deal with, you know, rising energy prices. As you said, I completely agree. I think that is a huge issue. So that for me is really the bulwark of what we need to be focusing on. Other than that, there are several other issues that I, I really want to see, you know. I really want to see changes in terms of the structures of political parties. I really want to see information being transferred thoroughly. I need to see, want to see more interest in politics and I want to see how the political parties, particularly the Conservative Party, whether they're able to unite or fragment on, on certain issues or not. But right. I think the economy is really the core one for me. OK, economy. What about you for Charlie? Uh, I agree with the economic point, but I think... Um, yeah, I consider myself a Conservative of the small C variety. I don't support the party mm. in the slightest. Interesting. Um, and... So it doesn't I, stand for what you stand for? No, I don't feel that way at all. Okay. Because for the last 50 years, maybe longer, the only conversation that Conservatives have cared about is the economic one. Now, of course, it goes without saying, the economic conversation is a very important one to have. Because if the economy goes, everything goes. With that being said, there are conversations that are not being had that are just as important as the economic ones. And again, it comes back to what I was just saying. It's about an attitude. It's about... Who are we? You know, a nation is not just... It's not just a spreadsheet. It's not just what can be put into tables. And the most important thing is not the line on the graph continuously going upwards. Because there are concerns outside of that that you can't put into rational terms. OK, you're yeah. doing a very good job as a politician not answering questions. <laughs> um, so tell me, that what are your top three priorities, in order? Um, my first would be... As you said, the, the economy. economic side. That's fair Because, enough. again, that is, that is what underpins everything else. Yeah. But my second would be, again, a change in attitude from the Conservatives. I don't know if this is possible or whether they need to be replaced by a more young, energised party like Reform. Right. But it's, again, this, it's this short What do you mean by change in attitude? I mean, what I mean by that is... The Conservatives have this attitude of um, the only thing, the only conversations worth having are the ones that can be put into a spreadsheet and a table. There's no concern for aesthetic issues. Again, the idea that this is not just an international landing strip to be milked of its resources by anybody who arrives here. This is a nation. You know, this bit of land we call Britain is not just the, you know, the material that makes it up. There are stories here. There's history here. And I want a, 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 an appreciation for that by those in power, because it feels to me like there hasn't, that hasn't existed. So interesting. I've never heard anyone <clears throat> say that, and it's really refreshing. Really, really good. OK, just in terms of where we are, I'm deeply nervous about the autumn statement, deeply nervous, because I don't know what they're going to do. I don't think anyone knows what they're going to do, and that's why we're all sort of waiting for November the 17th. Um, so, Jonathan, where, where, where do you think... Uh, I mean, clearly things are not going to be easy. We're talking about it may be 50% uh, tax rises. It may also be a restriction of services. What do you think the government has to do and for how long? The government cannot make everyone happy with this budget. It's simply 100%. impossible. Kemi Badenek referred to it when she was talking about why she backed Rishi as opposed to Liz, saying that you can't have, you know, cakeism in terms of having your cake and eating it. There are going to be really hard, horrible measures that are going to be implemented that are going to make people really, really upset. I think you could in some way have some sort of return to austerity, almost... George, George Osborne levels of austerity, which I think could be really, really significant in But don't you think people. people have suffered enough? People have suffered much. I mean, I was hearing from a, a cleaner, a lady who yeah. really struggled. She couldn't put food on the table. She's very angry about the whole yeah. thing. And here we go again. Yes, no, I completely agree with you. And I don't think, I think we really need to focus on how we're redistributing money because I don't think the policies that are, um, were being implemented were fair. I think the companies that are making record profits this year. I don't think they should be making record profits. I understand the need for a free market, but at the same time, you know, there has to be some level of redistribution that means companies aren't making record profits and benefiting off the Ukraine crisis in terms of... Get so you're talking, about, you're, you're talking about uh, fuel producers, for example. Yeah, for, and, yeah and exactly. So would you have a windfall tax? Yes. You would? Yes. OK, what about you, Charlie? Wait, what, what, what can the government do? Because I think Jonathan's right. There is no way you could appease everyone. It is going to be impossible. We've got this huge black hole. Mm. I mean, interestingly, they think they may have sold £15 billion just by delaying the autumn statement and then obviously having uh, grown-ups marking their mm. work. Um, but just in terms of, of how you think or how do you think they might play this i think we're in for a very tough winter yeah, and true. an analogy that jordan peterson has used in the past is if you're if you're the captain of a cruise liner and you see dead ahead of you an iceberg if you can see the iceberg it's actually already too late to correct course and i feel like that's that's the type of situation we're in it's i don't want to sound too pessimistic because i also very much believe in a positive vision i think we should be optimistic 
But I think it is the reality that we are staring down the barrel of some very hard times ahead. And yeah. so I think whatever the government does, uh, as you said, they're not going to please everyone. And I think either way, it's going to be a very difficult... I mean, who knows how long this is going to going to last for? This could be years. This could be decades. So let's just talk about energy because I I was absolutely gobsmacked this week when Rishi Sunak or Caroline Lucas basically I thought um, uh, sort of uh, got him by surprise and said, "Are you going to ban fracking?" And he said, "Yes." What did What did you make of that? So, firstly, just on the previous point, I wanted to add that I think freezers will be put in place in order to try and make. Oh, 100 percent. So, in terms of freezers, yes. In so you get of, fiscal drag. Yeah. But in terms of the fracking, actually, my my opinion on that has slightly changed. Oh, and has it? That was after reading some articles that were from actually executives working in fracking, and they said that it will take four years or at least four years in order to actually extract the resources, the energy. So, I previously thought that, you know, fracking would be fantastic in terms of ensuring we have a domestic supply quickly. But the problem is, there's actually no solution because we don't have that domestic supply because we stopped fracking in 2019 and because we didn't build a nuclear energy power plant. So it's not actually going to be a short term plan, you know, and I think so that's basically our fault because we've done nothing as yeah, usual. And I, don't, I don't think fracking is even a solution to it, you know, I just don't think it will help. Because uh, were you surprised that he literally answered her there and then? So in some ways, no, actually, because of his refusal to go to COP27 and because of, you know, his demotion of, you know, the, 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 the environment, clearly, within the cabinet, Alan Sharma, he probably wants to show that he cares slightly about it. So maybe he's trying to create that image for political gain rather than actually for, you know, any particular interest or any particular s severe economic policy. And what, where, what, where do you stand, Charlie, on, on energy? Because at the moment, I, all I hear is net zero, net zero. What, what are you, I mean, I think young people are very passionate about the environment, mm. but to me, if you're holding up net zero by 2050, but you don't care that people are going to freeze to mm. death over the winter, that seems to me rather ridiculous. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolute non-consequentialism. It's the ends justifying the means. And that, you know, it's, it's self, it's self evident that that is a, a bad way to behave in politics. Um, because sure, climate issues are important, but at what cost? Mm. You know, if we ban fracking and that means that, you know, the winters to come are far more difficult for the most vulnerable in our society, that can't be a good. Surely that can't be a good. Uh, no, indeed. Uh, by the way, um, I just have to tell both of you, wow, says Louise, Charlie and Jonathan have given me hope for the future. Such passionate young men, can we please clone them? <laughs> I thought you'd like that very much indeed. Uh, lots of those. Uh, Jonathan, apparently lots of people are upset your poppy's fallen off. Yeah, no, I was very disappointed about I that. Know, I thought it would be a bit stick... awkward mid-show. I know, I know, but anyway, I just thought <laughs> I mentioned it. He has it's got not, a poppy. It's not for any political purposes. I am very much in support of wearing a poppy. <laughs> very good. Yeah. What a well, statement, John. I, I, just, I just thought that mentioned yeah, it. Uh, Lucy Waddle says, though, Jonathan, where do you think the money comes from? Your ma ma money magic tree? Where do, you, where do I think the money comes well, from? Well, I don't know. I think I think you were being fair, actually. I think you said, actually, it's going to yeah, be very Yeah, it's going to have to come from somewhere. I think it's yeah. going to come from, you know, it's going to have to come from rich people, unfortunately. Well, or fortunately for poor, poorer people. Well, so here's an interesting <laughs> thing, because I get a sense that the middle classes, the middle earners are mm. always squeezed, and I, I see this time and time again, and I tell you what, there is a lot of unrest on the streets. Mm. I think there's a demographic that's sort of not being tapped into, which is above the middle class, which is the super wealthy. Sure. And the problem is that it's very, very difficult to tax them. It's a place which I think we need to be able to tap into. But, you know, as you get richer, you find better ways to get around tax loopholes and to avoid paying tax and, to, you know, move to Jersey and avoid paying tax. But it's really, really important that we try and focus on ways to actually get getting money through these sorts of means, you know. There's lots of people that have far more money than, you know, the middle class. The top 1% have significantly much more money than, you know, the, the top 10%. Mm. And I think tapping into those sorts of resources, tapping into not attacking small businesses, because, you know, we they're really, really suffering, but ta tackling and trying to tap into businesses which are making record profits as a result of these... Um, these, you know, times, which, yeah. as I said, is really important. That's where the money's going to come from, in my opinion. That's the only way. I mean, I agree totally. And, of course, with the cost of uh, the price of electricity is pegged to the price of gas. And it seems to me a lot of these renewables are making record profits as well. And we need to actually ensure that we're... Uh, for me, I want an energy mix. I think we need British energy security. Um, and that has to be key, doesn't it, into the, to the whole equation, that we oh, need to have energy security. I totally agree with that. And I think that, you know, uh, avenues like nuclear power need to be, you know, taken seriously. Um, I think it's it's 
it's been shown by you know the likes of Germany relying on foreign powers for something as fundamental as energy is a terrible idea. Yeah, and it should be if that should be obvious. But here's the thing: you see, when I was much younger than you, they built Sizewell A. Mm. Then they built Sizewell B when I was probably your age. And of course, we've done absolutely nothing since because no one has any vision mm. in this country. And I remember Nick Clegg saying, "Well, there's no future in nuclear because it wouldn't wouldn't be till 2022 mm. when it came online." Well, guess what? It would be online. Yeah, yeah. So, so again, we need to have some uh, some real thought and and that kind of longer term plan just in terms of immigration i think this is number one mm. on many people's mm. lips Thirty nine thousand people have come to this country uh, we have processed four percent of those people who have actually applied mm. for asylum i think that's a shocking indictment of the mm. home office uh, what what do you uh, i'm not asking you for the solution because it's too difficult what do you think needs to be done? Well, I, I think I'm in agreement with Peter Whittle on this, and I think we need a moratorium on immigration so that we can have a minute to catch our breaths and, uh, and assess where we are as a nation. Because Interesting. So how, how would a moratorium work? I think that we, we simply stop giving out visas. We say, I'm sorry, for the foreseeable future, we're full. We need to deal with the, the domestic issues that we have right now. Because, again... Immigration, the justification always given by the Conservatives is, again, it was what I was saying earlier, it's the line has to go up, GDP, economics, and obviously important, but there are issues other than that. There are social cohesion issues. You look at Leicester, what's been happening there, and, you know, these issues are not considered, it seems, by the likes of the Conservatives. So if we just, again, a moratorium on immigration, stop giving out visas for, you know, um, I, I don't know how long that would need to take, you know. But what about skilled mm. skilled uh, people coming here? If we need doctors, if we need nurses, surely you need to have visas. Well, I think, I think that, you know, we kind of need to uh, put put the feet to the you know the feet of the people of this country to the flames and say we're not going to be importing you know these skilled uh, workers from foreign lands our people have to do it you have to get up and, and, well, and the, well, the big issue with that, of course, is we don't train enough doctors, mm. and that's simply true. And those that we are mm. training, 25% leave in the first year. Mm. But, OK, so that's quite interesting. Mm. But just in terms of, uh, of the people arriving by boat, is there mm. a solution? Do you think that we need to do something with France? Many people are very angry about the fact mm. that, we're, we, we, that they feel France isn't doing enough. Mm. France is saying they are doing enough. What's your thoughts? I, it should be an absolute zero-tolerance policy on the boats crossing the Channel. Because, again, I'm in touch with history, and this has been a story that... Britain has been through many, many times throughout the, you know, the, the thousand years of its history. Interesting. You know, we had, it was the Danes a thousand years ago, and now it's the Albanians. And um, I think it really needs to be as simple as you, we turn them around and we send them back to France. Interesting. Because you know, we can't... can't. Yeah, no, no, I was going to ask Jonathan. I mean, obviously, mm -hmm. I think many people feel, share that sentiment. It, it is more complicated mm -hmm. than that. There are real people who are coming here for refugee status. We've mm -hmm. seen that the numbers approved are something like 85% or 4%. But that is before, as Charlie rightly says, we factor in the Albanians, which now make up about 80%. Mm -hmm. Albanian, not a war-torn country, waiting for EU accession. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you can come here on a visa anyway. So... Maybe Charlie's right that any Albanian should be sent back immediately. I have to actually disagree with with Charlie quite well, quite, strong, quite, quite strongly on that. The first the first point in that the Tories don't care about immigration. I think Pretty Patel, Swilla Braverman, very much care about immigration. I think they're very Liz Truss didn't. No, Liz Truss mm. was the reverse. You know, she was very yeah, interested. Yeah, but she I think, wanted everyone. Yeah, in. but I think that was actually because she recognised that lots of her departments and lots of the people that were working in industry were saying to her, "We do not have enough workers." You know. Next day delivery, Amazon are saying, you know, next day delivery might have to be shut. I went to the hairdressers the other day. They said, we literally cannot find anyone. You know, we've got long queues of people waiting to get their hair cut. We used to be able to find people from abroad, train them up very quickly, you know, get them quite fairly low paid work and, you know, provide resources. And we simply can't do that anymore. And that's not just across, you know, one or two industries. That's across industries as a whole. If you talk to any recruitment, they will tell you they do not have enough people working. It's all very well saying, you know, British people should take their jobs. But where are these British people? You know, there's always jobs there. There's always jobs available. It's very easy to get jobs which are very highly paid, you know, in, in driving and in things which do not require high skill. We simply do not have the so, work. So I think there's another problem at play here. I think many people over 50 actually thought COVID was so terrible they retired. And I know that from some of my friends that they just said, I'm not doing this anymore and retired. And actually, we need to get them back into the workforce. I think a lot of businesses rely far too heavily on thinking young things are the answer because they have great new ideas actually experience matters too doesn't it I, I totally agree i find it really interesting that you use the example of like next day amazon delivery because this is exactly the attitude i'm talking about it's, it's this attitude that all that matters is i get you know i get my package tomorrow i've got someone to serve me my coffee and prep you know this that this and there's no concern for 
<laughs> the trade-offs, because the trade-offs are, again, a sacri the sacrifice of, again, this grand artistic project that is Britain to, to make in, in, in the name of convenience. But, isn't, name but of isn't it actually, we've got people who are unemployed yeah. here uh, that could go and, and be put in those jobs in this country? There's two things. I think there's a very big difference also, firstly, between immigrants and refugees. You yes, know? of course there is. So, so, for example, you know, much of my family, my wider family, they actually were, were in Poland or, or Germany during the Holocaust, right? They tried to come to, I don't know, whether it was America or Australia, and they were turned back on ships to their imminent death you know yeah. and I'm not saying anything like the Holocaust is going on today you know it's not that's not what that's I'm saying China. what I'm saying well Holocaust you, you, yeah I've done a huge amount of work on China I'm banned from China I've, I've campaigned for about five years on, on the Uyghurs in China and I'm very very passionate about that very and best. we need to we need to we need to be you know supporting refugees in some way I understand that there's a trade-off and I understand that we want some sort of shared national identity and culture I do understand that argument my response to that would be firstly in terms of refugees you know there, there has to be some sort of humanitarian sense there and in terms of, of course, immigrants of economic sense but surely Surely, what we should be doing is increasing processing so that actually 85% yes. are processed within completely, a month. Completely. So we make a decision. Those people that are really granted asylum status stay here, a refugee mm. status stay here, and those that are not eligible are deported. Completely. That is the answer, isn't it? And therefore resourcing it properly. By the way, uh, this is from Dan in Hampshire. Hi, David. I love the show and also the attitude of these two lads. Uh, the problems will never be truly solved through the politicians themselves. The short-term re-election view always comes into conversation but never gets properly addressed. It's the key issue and the lack of solutions. 650 MPs, their only care is the next election. So long-term fixes never come into the question. How on earth do we change that? Thank you very much. I mean, it's really good. I mean, actually, there's also one here saying, great to see two young Jacob Reese moggs on the show. Uh, so confident in their opinions based on their vast experience. Oh, dear, if this is the future, we're doomed. So, you, I mean, that's, that's the beauty of political debate, isn't it? That some people like you and some people don't. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's, that's, where, that's where the fun comes from. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think immigration is such, like, a, a hot topic, you know, and it's what's led to the election of people like Donald Trump, Gavin Wilders, Victor Orban, across the whole of Europe, across America, across the world. It's such an important decision, and it's such an important conversation we need to be having. Of course it is, but, but I think Charlie is right also. I think we need to take a step back. Obviously, I campaign for Brexit. I'm a great passionate Brexiteer. It's an absolute dog's dinner at the <laughs> moment. We haven't Brexited properly. Mm. We've abandoned Northern Ireland. I think it's utterly disgraceful and I think Rishi Sunak needs to sort this out the question is will he and do you think he will no I don't I don't think the will exists in the Tory party because again they're captured by this this internationalist rationalist Bla Blairite attitude this ideology and I just don't think the will is there unless the Tory party can be completely changed in its attitude I think that the only solution is again as I said for a young energized fresh positive you know a, a party with a positive vision for this country like reform to take their place. OK, thank you very much. Charlie Jonathan? So I think the will is there for the Conservative Party because Rishi was a Brexiteer, you know, he wanted Brexit to happen. Where was he? Well, he claims he was, you know. Ah, oh, there you go. He claims he, claimed... he was. Like, he wouldn't claim he was surely unless he actually oh, was. Oh, he's a politician, think? John. Maybe he's a politician. I don't, I don't think many people... He must have been a very skilled politician if he saw Brexit happening, because I don't think a lot of people, honestly, like, um, on, on the heads up, hand, hand on heart, can say they absolutely knew Brexit was a certainty. And it was close, you know. Well, I know, I was there. Yeah, exactly. You, you, know, <laughs> you, know, you know more than I me. I was in the I wasn't, I, wasn't, I wasn't old enough to vote. So. Oh, God. <laughs> right, that's you, fine. Right. Uh, thank you very much to both of you uh, for coming in. That's Jonathan Gibson and also Charlie Downs, both uh, political commentators. You see young people with vision, with passion, and they love politics. This is Talk TV.